Thank you, Bob. And thank you to everyone for showing and up. And check the microphones. Make sure they're all turned on. Do I hear him? Yes. Well, thank you, Bob, again. And thank you, everyone, for having us here tonight. Uh, you just said my name, Sean Harris. I was born and raised here in Yuba City, fourth generation Yuba City resident. I attended our local schools all the way up through Yuba College. I raised a family here. I have three uh, great children. Um, I, uh, two of them are here, excuse me, one of them is here tonight. One has to work and one is deployed to Kuwait right now. Um, I, uh, also my kid's mom, wife of 10 years, Karen, right over here. And then my mother, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, several other people here. I really appreciate you guys showing up today. Fourth generation UC resident, as I said, attend local schools. I immediately decided I wanted to go into public service, specifically public safety. I started the Southern County Sheriff's Office and by Kenny Ammo, GB County, and then the California Highway Patrol. I've been uh, serving with California Highway Patrol for the last 22 years. I'm currently a rank as captain, serving as your commander for um, all the CHP goings on for all of the people in Sutter County. It's a, uh, been a pretty vibrant career. I tell you, I've got a lot of experience. If you travel around and move up the ranks in different places, I've had an opportunity to work and serve in the desert, San Francisco, uh, Lake Tahoe, and the Central Valley. And I can bring that experience of management, personnel, managing a fleet, budgets, interacting the value of uh, developing relationships to move forward for a common good and common purpose. I can bring that to, with me to the City Council. I'm looking forward to do that to serve you, and I uh, appreciate your vote. Thank you. Wade Kirshner. Thank you very much. My name is Wade Kirshner, and I am running for City Council. I am a lifelong resident of Yuba City and proud to be to say that Yuba City is my home. Um, I am a, a a product of the, uh, the school system in Yuba City. Um, I'm married to my wife, Lisa. We have a nine-year-old son, Jack. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Chico State graduate product. Um, I spent 18 years in the private sector, a company called Baitmark as their uh, Northern California sales manager. And then um, I'm currently employed by Yuba City Unified School District in the uh, public sector as a educator. In my spare time, um, I'm currently a member of the Sutter County Grand Jury. <coughs> I'm involved in the acting, the acting company. Uh, my, my family and I are, are uh, members of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. I also spent time uh, volunteering with the Marysville Cemetery Board, um, also with the UC High School uh, grad night organization. Once elected, the three things I'm going to concentrate on are public safety, fiscal responsibility, and fixing our uh, aging infrastructure, our roads. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dina Walker. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Dina Walker, and I want to thank, um, thank you all for this op opportunity. I'm decided to run for city council early on this year and kind of thought about it and thought, well, this is something different in my life and I, I want to serve the people and, um, you know, be a part of the community, um, you know, help out, you know, with issues that we have and we all know we have a lot. Um, I raised my family here, uh, three kids, I have six grandchildren, um, very proud family. And uh, I want to make a difference, you know, in the community. And I've been involved with um, fundraisers. I help the homeless. I've worked in worked in the food and retail retail and food service industry most of my life. Um, and I've worked with a lot of people and have great relationships with with everyone, business owners, small business, uh, large business, and uh, problem solving is what I like to do, and I want to be um, part of a team and work with, uh, you know, work with the city staff and and try to make this community a, a better place to live. All right, thank you. Okay, Jason Riker. Hi, I'm Jason Riker, running for city council. I'm in construction. I'm a worker. I'm boots on the ground. Um, right now, I'm in charge of a $57 million project down in Sacramento, part of K Street. Or revitalizing K Street down there. 
I saw some problems with the city a few years back and decided to run for city council. The problem is, is I live and die by budget folks. And with that being said, if I don't meet my budget or meet my deadlines, they're looking for somebody else to deliver their projects. Looking at the city, they haven't met a budget in quite a while, and they haven't met any deadlines, which in the long run ends up costing us all money. We're all taxpayers. It ends up taking money out of our pocket. The city council we have right now seems to rubber stamp everything that comes across the table. They get a budget for Bridge Street at 2.3 million. It comes back at 3.2 million. They rubber stamp it. That's $900,000 on a $2 million project. That's unacceptable. And that's everyone in this room's money that they're just sending down the, down the river without asking why did we miss that budget by that much. I'm going to start holding people accountable at City Hall. You folks, when I'm elected, will take your voice to the City Hall administrators, the executive staff, and find out why they're not sticking to their guns on what they're delivering to us. Thank you. Men or do it. First of all, I would like to thank the Chamber and the Hill Democrat, you folks, for being here tonight. My name is Manny Cardoza. I'm a resident, born resident, city of Yuba City. I'm a proud father of three daughters, which I am proudly raised here in the community, and a proud grandfather of four grandchildren. Uh, at a young age, I was lucky enough to be hired on with the city of Yuba City. I started on in the finance department and a few years later transferred in the public works division which I finished on a nearly 35 year career. I have great knowledge of the infrastructure and how the city operates. I care deeply about our safety of the citizens of the city of Yuba City. I want to make sure our fire and PD have the state of the art technology, equipment, training, and be fully staffed. I'd also like to address homelessness. Yesterday, we went down and visited the homeless camp in the River Bottoms to see if we could be doing better as a city. I'm here because I want to make a difference in the city. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Fotina Halicus Copriva, please. Yes, thank you, Bob. First of all, thank you folks for coming out this evening. My name is Fotine Halicus Copriva. My husband is in the back of the room, by the way. His name is John. And without him, I couldn't do half the things I've done in this community of 15 years. We moved here by choice, raised our kids here by choice, opened a business in successful five different locations over 11 years. So I am the only one at this table that has signed the front side of the check for over 25 years actually, I've been in business for myself. So I bring to the table the opportunities to create business and that's what I wanna do in this community. That's what I've done, I've hired, Unfortunately, I've fired, I've created jobs, and I'm very proud of that. Everyone here at this table, including myself, all feel that we want to have a safe community. And I think it's important. We need to do more things for our police department, our sheriff's department, our firemen. But one of the things we have to do first is we have to build business in order to pay for those things. So my first and foremost thing on my job list is to actually bring ag manufacturing back create opportunities for our 12 to 24 year olds, and also find a way to increase our local jobs to get those kids back to work so that they don't leave our area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the opening uh, introductions and statements. And uh, Steve Miller from the Appeal Democrat will have the first question, and he'll be delivering that to Wade Kirshner. Same uh, first question as we asked the supervisor candidates. In your opinion, what are the two biggest problems in Yuba City? What will you do to solve those problems? I think the the first, unfortunately, um, I'm going to bring up the homeless issue. Um, I think we're I, I think we're kind of behind the the, the the ball on this issue. I think Marysville has done a, a good job in, in the past few months uh, tackling this 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 problem with the. Uh, when they brought in a full-time coordinator, and also with their uh, tough shed program. Uh, the second issue, uh, I, th I think, is, uh, how do we bring jobs to this area? I, I don't believe that uh, government uh, creates jobs. I think businesses create jobs. And I think when um, 
uh, businesses come to this area, they, they, they come to this area just like a, a private citizen would. They, they research, they see what the, uh, the infrastructure infrastructure looks like, uh, what the crime looks like, and they, they make, make their decisions from there. So I think if we address those problems, uh, we, those businesses would be more apt to, uh, to come to this area. A couple of the issues that I, I feel is, you know, public safety is really huge. Um, I'm a big advocate of that. Um, I think with, you know, making sure that we have enough police, um, you know, law enforcement out there to take care of, you know, crime. I think that needs to taper down a little. Um, another is homeless, uh, the homeless situation. I, um, been doing a lot of research on, uh, looks like the Marysville and the city been fighting over, um, you know, who's going to um, support the homeless. Um, and I know they've been going back and forth. So it looks like in the last couple days, uh, they've come up, as we all um, learned already, uh, an associate to, an advocate to, um, to streamline that. And they have like a year, I guess, to get results. But, Looks like we're going in, in the direction to take care of that. Thank you. Jason? Police response times now have come to my attention. They're a very, very big issue in our area, in Yuba City. One thing we used to do when I was in fire and CDF was we'd have substations for sheriffs at our fire departments. I would like to do the same thing here in the city. We would be to see if we couldn't get a police officer at each fire department to have a booth or a desk, a cubicle, something, to where they could actually get from the fire station, because our fire stations are pretty strategically placed around the city, for response times. So if we did the same thing with a police officer and stuck him in a fire station, rather than just roaming around the city, they could respond quicker to other things. That'd be one. Another one is making sure our city executive staff is doing the job that they're paid to be doing, and somebody is checking up on that. Because right now it doesn't seem like it's being checked up on very well. So, okay. men? Well, it is one of my main platform issues running for council, and it's really big in my heart. Of course, number one is the homelessness. It's an issue, and it's not going away, and we're here to try making it better. Uh, working together as a region, both Marysville, Yuba County, Sutter County, Yuba City. So we all work together as one. We can try and help these folks, give them some affordable housing, some training, and also some work. Uh, second one that I think is also very important is uh, our gang, gang violence and crimes in the community. We need to have the police departments fully staffed, get our gang task force back uh, in full force, because without that, we can't raise the family safe in the community, who wants to live in the community, and what business would want to come here. So that would be my two biggest issues at this time. Thank you. Go, Jean. Could you please repeat that question? Sure. Uh, in your opinion, what are the two biggest problems in Yuba City, and what will you do to solve those problems? Well, the two biggest problems that I see is increased violence in our community. And I believe the reason that is is because we don't have enough opportunities for a lot of those kids in those areas. A lot of kids are going home to um, families that don't exist or don't have support systems. They're going home to themselves and staying home by themselves as latchkey kids. When I moved here and I brought my preteen children here, there was nothing for them to do after school. So there's a lot of improvement that we need to do for that 12 to 24 year old range to be able to take care of our kids. We have a wonderful community here in so many ways but there's things that we need to be able to create as infrastructure, and the way to do that is to have more business here. So that's my first and foremost. And then the next thing I'd like to see is to create that infrastructure through those businesses. So we can, um, let me just say this, the anti-bullying program that's out there that stands for the silent, probably many of you know about that. I've been working with, uh, with her right now to actually create more opportunities for kids in that age range and our seniors, and we're starting to put it all together. And Sean? At the risk of uh, sounding like a uh, repeat, public safety and jobs, in my opinion, are the two biggest problems we have. And what I would specifically do about that as, as your councilman, first thing I'm going to do is capitalize on the experience and the relationships I already have in our law enforcement community, both on both sides of the river. 
and I had met with uh, Chief Landon and asked him directly what he could do possibly with those. And I discovered that he has openings in his public service, community service officer position, which is, if you don't know, these are people that are trained to investigate crime scenes, take uh, low grade reports and whatnot, when the officer, the paid peace officer, is otherwise uh, able to be out on the road patrolling what we would expect him to be fighting crime. We have to save money, it's a, good, it's a great deal, and I think we could benefit from that. Also jobs, work with Downtown Business Association, work with the Economic Development Corporation, work on both sides of the river as a region to create an environment that businesses thrive. That will also help our homeless problem, interviewing the homeless folks, that's one, one thing they said was we want more jobs. Kind of two to one on that aspect. I'm out of time, unfortunately, I could go on for a long time on the issue. Okay, our um, next uh, question is going to be one on transportation. And we'll start with Dina. What can be done to make sure that public transit expands while remaining accessible and affordable? What other ideas do you have for innovative ways to provide transportation to vital services? Well, from my aspect of, I mean, I, I commute, I'm in, I'm in food sales, I travel probably about a, it's seven to a thousand miles a week. Thought about getting on the um, bus that goes out to uh, Sacramento, you know, leave my car in Sacramento. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I, I think we, we pretty much have a handle on, on transportation here. Um, we have a lot of busing. Um, you know, it's, it seems to be working. Um, I don't know that we would um, be able to compare to what Sacramento has. Uh, but I think, I don't, I don't think we have an issue there. Okay, Jason. It's a very good question. The big thing is working down in Sacramento, you have to plan very, very accordingly to what your needs are. Because the fact is, as you see the new arena, they planned, but they didn't plan enough. Because the fact is, is now you have 17,500 people dump out on the street all at one time and they've got light rail, they have buses, but the problem is, is they don't have enough. So it's a very touchy subject. I mean, general planning is gonna be huge in that aspect. So taking general plan and seeing what Yuba City has planned is gonna be huge in trying to figure out how we're going to do and provide enough general transportation around. So it's really gonna depend on what the general plan has and we're gonna to have to really review that. Manny, can you please repeat the question? Okay. What can be done to make sure that public transit expands while remaining accessible and affordable? What other ideas do you have for innovative ways to provide transportation to vital services? As your council member, I would go over to regional tra uh, transit, uh, sit down and talk with them, uh, see their thoughts and ideas, uh, myself, personally, at this time, I'm going to have to do some homework on it. I really, I'm not aware of the issue. I cannot really answer the question, but I will be doing some homework. I will be asking questions, getting advice, and coming back and working with my fellow uh, council members uh, to solve the problem. I'm sorry at this time, I'd have to come back and answer this uh, better at another time. Thank you. Okay, go to you. Well, first off, um, our transit system that we have now serves our area to a degree. We have a lot of folks that are without vehicles, and um, it is important. I think we need to go through our counterparts in Sacramento to see what kind of funding that we can have on a regional basis to bring more of that here so we can expand it. It is a process of planning. That does mean that we have to sit down and take a look at what we can do to expand it. Those regional services that you're talking about are our hospital that's on the opposite side of the river and uh, being able to get those folks back and forth is important. So from a planning standpoint, uh, we need to address those things now as we start to expand our community. But I think the funding needs to come out of Sacramento because I don't think we have it locally. So at that point, I think we need to go there. Sean. It definitely, planning is the key there. As a member of your planning commission, I thought we had an opportunity to study very thoroughly our general plan all the way down, not just the city limits, throughout the state of influence. There's a lot of roadways planning, a lot of things that need to take place before we can get the expansion ahead. But planning, the proper places to have the bus stops, 
for example, and also connecting people with that resource. Let's promote that business. It goes right back to the previous question. Let's expand these folks, get, let people know the environmental, the, the fiscal, and all the savings they can have by using public transportation. My son rides it for the fun of it. Just finds a reason to go, and it's a great resource that we have. You plan that out there, you get money, the Sacramento Area Council of Governments, we are a member of that. The city is represented on that. We have a member of city council. We can go out and, and seek funding, properly planned out, and then fund those expansion efforts. And I think it's going to be a great thing to, to make our community more vibrant. Wait. <coughs> Good question, Bob. Um, the last Live Oak Council meeting uh, I attended, uh, they were ta tapping the, uh, this, this, this topic. It's got to make sense. I mean, we can't be sending uh, empty buses from place to place. What they were, what they were having to deal with at the time was uh, initially the, um, the, the the new Ewood College facility on um, Pease Road looked like a, a very viable um, stop for for Live Oak, and it turned out that wasn't the case. So uh, the 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 need needs to be addressed, and um, if there's not a need, a need the, the, the stops need to be done more efficiently, and, and that goes with the plan. Okay, thanks very much. And Steve, next question goes to Jason first. Um, I think all of you have touched on this in your opening statements, but it, it's pretty important, so let's spend a little more time on it. In recent months, there have been several shootings in the Yuba Sutter area. There's a perception that crime in the Yuba Sutter area in general has been on the rise, and there's specifically concern over gang activity. What's your plan to combat violent and gang crime? Also, uh, we noted that residents seem to be very concerned also about property crimes, vandalism, thefts, burglaries. What needs to be done about that? <laughs> well. It really is an issue right now. I mean, if you look around, we've got tagging all over the place. We do have a lot of, I mean, realistically, when was the last time we ever heard of a drive by shooting in Yuba City? It's not that often. This is something very, very new. And our police department really needs to get a handle on it. That would be a huge thing for me to start off with, would be sitting down with the police department and figuring out what we can do to get a handle on this. I'm not a police officer. I don't know what can be done. But I'm definitely sure that we can provide some kind of funding to get a handle on this thing right away because it's got to be dealt with. Man, well, that's pretty personal uh, with me because uh, the last three shootings we've had in the area have all been within a mile of where I live. Um, law enforcement is uh, not a very popular profession right at the moment, but working together with council and staff, we will make sure our police department properly staffed, fully equipped, uh, once again, and, our city and as a city council member, I'll search for funding and reestablish and fill the, uh, the gang task force. And citizens are our eyes and ears of the community. And if they feel threatened to call in something, we want to make sure that it's safe for them to have the respect for the police department to take care of all their needs. Thank you. Putin. Well, as a resident of Yuba City, I've been burglarized in my business, I've been burglarized at my home, and so it's pretty personal with me. Um, what I'd like to do about it, I don't know if we can afford to do it, but I sure would like to put more staff on the streets, uh, more boots on the ground, so to speak. But as a business um, down on Plymouth Street, I see firsthand a lot of the things that go on and working with our local um, police department. In fact, we had a conversation with an officer just recently, and he talked at length about the issue of our police department as far as needing uh, more staffing. And they're in the middle of that right now. They're in the middle of bringing on more officers. The training process, it's about $100,000 per officer to bring them into the fold so that they're ready to be on the street. So there is some good news coming down the road. And obviously, as our uh, district attorney is in the, on, uh, in the audience, I personally want to tell her, thank you, Amanda Hopper, for doing the job that you've done in this community. Amen. Amen. Yes, we do have a gang task force currently in place. I had one of my officers was on that and also in Net 5 uh, for a while. We're going to look at putting them back in that. They, 
I think of a, a two-pronged approach to this. One is enforcement, and the other is making sure we inform the public as much as we possibly can, how to protect themselves, what are the warning signs, what steps can you take to protect your property, to protect yourselves, that includes the CCW, in my opinion, and also the enforcement aspect, okay? The gang task force is one thing. We just, we just put together one recently where we took nine individuals to jail, and I think we made an impact, and that, as you may, may not know, when we interview these three folks, some of that transitions to more and more risk and you start getting the ball rolling towards this. <coughs> it's a social problem. We need to be innovative. But the bottom line comes down to accountability, get more people on the street to put these people behind bars and let them know that we will not tolerate that. But in our small town, these issues are reasons why people, a lack of those issues are reasons why people move here. We don't want to drive people away and thereby businesses away by not addressing it. Let's get on top of it and make a difference. Wait. Well, I, I don't think it's perception. I think it's definitely the reality of, of uh, what's going on nowadays. Um, it, Chief Landon uh, made a presentation at City Council about a month ago, and it's not just a huge city problem, it's a California problem. Many, many, many cities are having difficulty uh, staffing and, and retaining qualified officers. Uh, the, the examples that were given uh, was a, was a $15,000 hiring bonus in, 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 in Stockton, uh, a $10,000 hiring bonus in Chico. Um, the, so I, I think it's more of a, uh, re, uh, a recruitment issue. We, we, need, we need to get up to, uh, our, 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 we need our ranks to be full. We need to be a uh, full uh, staff, staff fire, uh, excuse me, a full fully staffed police department. And, uh, and also the, the enforcement of that thing. Dina? Well, in a few years ago, my home was broken into. Um, I live in um, sub, you the city, but, um, and it, you know, if, when it happens to you, you don't, you know, it's different, you know. If it hasn't happened to you, you don't think it's a big deal. Um, but I do know that um, Yuba City and Sutter County Police, they, I think they do a great job, fantastic job. I do think that um, as we were talking about the gangs and um, the drug activity that's going on in our city and county, county and city, I think that if you know we need to streamline that a little bit more and try to uh, get a handle on um, you know be proactive and um, you know depending on the age, you know, if it's high school kids or um, you know early um, you know after adult, early uh, young, excuse me, young adults uh, that are involved. But I think we need to uh, get programs out there and get, keep the kids off the streets, um, do a little bit more um, of, you know, being proactive and uh, keep the crime down. Thanks. Okay, our next uh, question will start with Manning. Uh, how do we recruit and keep top, top notch law enforcement personnel? Um, Cuba City is uh, among the highest paying in this area, but yet we still have trouble obtaining and keeping personnel. And we have, I think, six or seven open officer positions. Okay. That's a. Uh, I'm glad you asked me that. <laughs> uh, I've been at the council, I've been attending the council meetings the last few months, and that is an issue with council. Uh, right now, the state is short on law enforcement statewide, nationwide. Uh, there's very lots of people retiring, and there's a uh, few coming out of the academy. So at this time, it's it's tough at this time to uh, get new police officers. Uh, right now, the uh, city is offering uh, a bonus to try drawing officers from other agencies, get some veteran officers from other agencies. But this isn't just a city of Yuba City's issue. This is statewide and nationwide. And with work with the council and uh, Chief Landon, we'll try to take care of this problem and make it safe for our community. Thank you. Go team. Well, it is true that we, um, we have a hard time getting qualified folks here. And part of that reason is, is we need more opportunity for those folks to do after they get off work. So if you think about it for a minute, you've got a young officer coming out of uh, school or the uh, academy, and he's in his 20s. What does he do when he gets off work? 
we don't have a lot of things for that age group in this area. And that's one of the problems that the officer that we were talking about earlier had discussed with our business group downtown. So there are those kinds of things to be dealt with. And we also have to look at the leadership of our community. The better our leadership in this community, the better that we will attract. We need to attract those folks that will come and live here and not be bedroom officers, meaning work here and live someplace else. When you live and work in the place that, um, you, basically you live and play and work all in the same place, it does make a big difference because you put your heart and soul into what you do. We have a huge community that is a bedroom community in Sacramento. We need more of them to actually work and stay here. Okay, Sean. Although I'm a little biased, I will say it's a bigger problem we have locally. We are, our, uh, our agency here, you can see the police department has been kind of a go-to agency because of the pay. But uh, recruiting is a nationwide problem for police officers. And you may, may, I'm sure you've all heard the problem with police officers, one bad apple in the, day, in the, in the age of uh, social media, one cop anywhere can make life hard for every cop everywhere in about two seconds. Just hit sin, right? And then you're only looking at this. a certain part of that video, people start talking, people protesting, and it snowballs. We need to bring the nobility and the public trust back to this profession because it's the greatest job in the world. Although the first thing I do every day when I get to work, I strap on a bulletproof vest. There's a reason for that, because it's dangerous. We can recruit those people with the proper mindset who want to serve for the right reasons, put forth a lot of effort. We can just get them to do that, break down those barriers, one contact at a time. Let them know that officers are here to help them and protect their lives. And let's make it happen together. Wait. <clears throat> so, Bob, the, um, the, the actual number is closer to eight that the, uh, the department's down. Uh, eight officers. Uh, the current plan for the city council is is more of a uh, recruitment. Uh, it's a twenty-five hundred dollar bonus, and the the strategy is that the the officers will reach out to friends that they know that are, that are officers to bring them to the area. And I think that's that's the way you uh, you attract it more. You attack it more on a, on a, on a personal level. Um, I think that the community. Uh, I, I, I really believe this community supports uh, law enforcement and um, if, if, if we can nurture that and become the place that they want to come other than just purely a monetary uh, incentive, the, the, the problem will be that solved. Thank you. Do you know? Well, law, law enforcement, you know, we definitely need them. Um, it's a big deal. Um, it's tough. I mean, uh, they're out there saving lives every day and trying to save their own life. Um, I believe, um, I, I do understand that there's incentives for referrals, uh, one officer to refer to, you know, someone else to come on board or um, get into the academy or program or whatever um, they have to offer. Uh, but I, maybe give a little more training out there uh, for the newbies that are, you know, maybe they're scared, you know, and they, instead of dropping out, you know, make them feel um, that they have the support that they need and, you know, more training. Okay. Jason? Well, monetary incentive will only take you so far. You have to be happy with where you are and with where you work. If you're not happy with both of those, then you're going to go elsewhere. It's just a fact of life. In my organization and construction, and my guys aren't happy to leave and go find another job. It's the same thing with police officers, I'm sure, that it isn't just monetary incentive. So it isn't just about wage. We need to get some things back to town that are going to keep them occupied here after they're off hours. The guys are a little bit more high strung. I mean, obviously, they're adventurous. They want to do something. I mean, we have a motorcycle trap, but you know, we need some other things like that that are going to do and keep these guys here. They're, like I say, it's an adrenaline rush, I'm sure, like when I was in fire. You're going to keep them where they work and play. You've got to have something for them to play whenever they do it. Again, I think we need to look internally also because if they're not happy, there's got to be a reason they're not happy. And they're moving on. If the pay is equal, then something's wrong somewhere. Steve, the next question you'll be starting with is about Thanks. Uh, we're going to move on to the subject of water. We had quite a few questions submitted from folks. So this is a three-parter. 
sorry. Okay. Number one, what's your assessment of how safe Yuba City is these days from the major flooding that has at times in the past devastated the area? Can I take these on one at a time? Sure. Okay. Uh, having been here 15 years, I did not experience the last major flood with the levees when the levees broke. Um, I am under the understanding that we have 200-year uh, levees around us. We're still working on certain parts of our levees. So, how are we? Say that again. I'm sorry. I got completely confused on that one. You're gonna run out of time pretty soon. I know. Get yeah. Quick. Uh, just uh, how safe are we these days? Honestly, I'm not fearful that we're gonna have a flood. Number two, how secure is Yuba City's water supply? At this point, I think we're okay. I think we still need to do a lot of conserving. And honest to God, I um, I don't think our conserving in uh, Yuba City is enough. I see a lot of green lawns, and my lawn's not very green, so I still think we need to do that. We've got a few seconds left for the zinger. How would you have handled the water rate increase? Uh, okay. First of all, I really do want to tackle this question. I, I really do want to address it. Okay. Have a few seconds. Okay. So I want to say, don't, I'm not stumbling. So I want to say this. I think that the most important thing that happened, or the, the lack of important thing that happened, was the maintenance long term over the last 10 years. We've been in the worst economic downturn we've ever seen. Our city has put off maintenance of certain kinds of things because there was no money. So we got into a situation where we couldn't take care of, or we did the, the least amount possible because of funding. You have to take care of your equipment regardless. In a restaurant, my refrigerator goes down, I can't serve you food. I gotta fix it. There's no I'll chance. Sean? It, it should have been taken care of. Why don't we give everybody an extra 15 seconds? This three parter is needs more than just a minute. Very generous. Yeah, let's do this. Can you read those? Part one, your assessment on flooding, uh, the danger of flooding. Part two, water supply. Part three, rate increase. Danger of flooding, my understanding and talking with folks or members of the Southeast Flood Control Agency is that we have solid levees around Utah City. 200 year floodplain, the slurry has been installed down below ground level for the levees. We are protected. There is some weak spot down at potential for some problems on the southwest portion of the city within the zone of influence, sphere of influence. So we're, we can, cannot necessarily not build there, but we may have to build up, raise up the foundation a little bit. So the levees, I live out in the Royal Ranchero area. Uh, my grandparents lived there in the lowest part of the city, and I think bumper to bumper, I feel safe here in the city. So, supply. Security of the supply. Depends on the weather. Now, how much water we have coming down that river. But I know that we, it's always smart to conserve, drought or not. If, you're gonna, if you have an opportunity to conserve water, conserve water. It doesn't matter. Think that we're going to be tightening our belt when we're short on money. Let's, we should be, if we can get by by tightening the belt anyway, we should always be doing business that way in government. And the water rate increase, I do support the decision that was made by our current city council. I understand that um, water and anything that happens, prices tend to go up. We have to make sure that we pay a little now to we're paying a lot later. Okay, Wade, you have 75 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <laughs> So as Mark Twain once said, there are two types of levees, the ones that are broken and the ones that will break. But having said that, I do feel confident in, in, in the levee reconstruction project that's gone through in the last five years with the slurry wall. Uh, secondly, um, with water supply, I, I think it's always a good, deal, a good idea to conserve water. We're still in a, in a, in a water, uh, excuse me, we're still in a drought, so I think uh, everyone should be uh, cognizant of that, uh, conserving water. To, the, to the, the issue of the water rates, something like that needs to be spread over a five-year program where it, 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 it's, it's addressed each year to decide whether or not you still need it. Thank you. Dina? Okay, the flooding. Um, you have a county, um, you know, endured um, devastation. Um, in that last flood a few years back. Um, ever since then, I, I think that uh, everybody, you know, start taking serious, you know, we need to look at the levees and start repairing. And I think, since I can remember, <coughs> that's something that they've always, um, 
you know, made a priority to, to, you know, to make our city safe. I don't think it's a, a, a serious issue um, at this point, but I think they still need to, um, and, you know, uh, do better, you know, to make everybody feel safe, you know. It's always going to be an issue, probably. Um, as far as the water increase um, scenario, um, wow, um, that's a big one. I think um, that was probably the increase was a little much, you know, for the city and the people. Um, I think they were, you know, quite surprised. That, um, you know, and I think if we were more transparent about, you know, what it was going to be for, and uh, you know why were they were increasing those um, the water rates? Um, I think the the people of our city uh, would probably understand a little more. Thank you. And uh, Jason. Okay, levies. We're a lot better off than we were five years ago. Yeah, we have some work to do, but we're a heck of a lot better off than we were. Plain and simple. Water. Yeah, we still have to conserve. We're sitting a lot down the river, but we also have the river to draw off of, so we're pretty lucky there. I mean, so our water is, we do got to conserve it, but the fact is we got more of it than a lot of people, so we need to take care of it. Water rate increase. This is a hot subject with a lot of people. Very underhanded how the city did it. Whenever you say you're going to get an increase, and you want to increase it so much, but you don't tell them that you're going to cut the amount of water that can be used for that raise, that's an issue. If you're going to do something, be up front and forthright about it. Don't try and hide it in a cut and an increase. The fact is, is the city did a very poor job. Whenever you install infrastructure, you know you have to do maintenance on it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Budget, whenever you build it. Otherwise, don't do the annexation and promise people you're going to provide it. It's on the city to make that difference up. The fact is, is we are, we do have inflation, we do have to raise rates, but do it forthright and be upfront about it. I think the citizens will be a lot more forgiving if you do it forthright and be upfront about it. Thanks. Amanda. Okay, um, in my history with the city, I was throwing sandbags in 1986 on Market Street, right behind where the Rod and Gun Club was. We had a weak point in the levee. We were very lucky that year. Marysville, uh, uh, Linda took the grunt of that, sorry to say. In 1997, we had another weak point down by our sewer treatment plant. I was throwing sandbags that night also, and the folks out in Oliver's took the grunt of that. I'm um, sorry about that also. Uh, now, 20 years later, our levees have been taken care of, as Sean said, uh, from Oroville all the way down here to the south side. We have a little bit left. Uh, city Council's gone to uh, Washington, D.C., got funding. Our levees are the safest they've been uh, for over 50 years. The uh, water issue, uh, we take our water out of the river. We're budgeted so much per year. I think our staff is doing a wonderful job. Uh, we had to have uh, cutbacks. Uh, the citizens of the community did a very good job of it. Uh, and on the third issue, uh, water uh, the raising of the water rates. Um, the city had to raise the rates for 10 years. Uh, if we would have raised it 75 cents a year for 10 years, we wouldn't have to do what we did last uh, six months ago or a few months ago. Uh, it's hindsight is. Uh... Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just play with it. We'll start the uh, next question with Sean, and uh, let's talk about homelessness um, across the river. Of course, Yuba County and Marysville. Have been dealing in a very aggressive way with homelessness uh, this year. And uh, how about in the city? What are the problems and what are the solutions? And what should be going on to take the same kind of aggressive standards? Well, a lot of this, Bob, is a homelessness. So you go up to Portland, Seattle, all over the country, you're going to have a homeless problem. It simply is a problem. Yuba County has done great steps in that direction. I think we could stand to partner with them more. We've already started moving the ball in that direction. And I think a lot of it, when I went down and talked to these folks in the river bottoms uh, very recently, again, the thing came up, jobs. And I think if we start addressing the problem on the front and back end, what got them there in the first place? Create jobs, the 
that's had some drug abuse issues, that's had some family counseling, you name it, there's as many reasons for being homeless as there are homeless people. Let's break that down and, and, uh, and address that. Be a part of the 14 Forward solution as well. And then I think we should develop a, uh, a partnership with those folks have on both sides, and also we have a tolerance level. You have communication, we want to take a humanistic approach, but that only goes so far. You cannot use our city as a toilet. We're going to draw the line, we're going to take care of business that way, too. Okay, wait. Thanks, Bob, and I, and I do agree. I think Cuba, Cuba County Marysville has, has attacked the problem head on. What you do is you get the folks that need help, help the folks that are just down on their luck, uh, medical bills, whatever, lost their job, that they're just, they're, they just need a hand up. You, you reach out and you, you find a way to help those folks. The, the folks that have uh, mental health issues, again, you provide services for those folks. Unfortunately, you have that third group that maybe they, they don't need that help or they don't, they don't want that help. Um, the way you approach it is you, you, you approach it on, on a regional level, uh, it, it's the, the old days of just pushing them back and forth across the river. It doesn't. It, it just doesn't make sense anymore. And it wouldn't make sense then. But I think what you do is you you, you attack it as a, as a community and as a region. You, you team up with Yuba County, Butte County, uh, Sutter County, uh, Live Oak, Gridley, and and you have a consortium and you come to an agreement and you reach out to the, those other communities. Like Sean said, it, it's not just in this area. You reach out to those other communities and find out what what, what worked for them. Okay, Dina. Yeah, um, homeless um, has been an issue here for you know all my life since I've been here. Um, you know, there's people out there that uh, want help, and there's people that don't want any, you know they don't want any help. Um, I would just do what the plans are coming forward um, uh, regionally. Uh, it looks like so Yuba City, Sutter County are working on um, a regional. Uh, system for the homeless and and looks like we're going to be um, working with Sacramento on uh, like those of fishes I've had um, an experience there I uh, help serve food there in the holidays um, we have an awesome program I think that if we follow a model uh, with this advocate person they did they just hired excuse me um, I guess they have a year to, to get results and I think if they work with Sacramento uh, we're going to get results uh, pretty fast. Thank you. Jason? The homeless is a big issue. Um, you look around, but it's not just our issue. It's an issue in every city, every county, everywhere. It's just a sign of our times. It's hard to get a job, it's hard to keep a job, and you're looking for the next job while you're on a job. It's just, it's really bad out there. As far as helping them, we're going to have to help as much as we can, but we also can't break the bank doing it. We're going to have to be very, very careful and walk a very fine line doing this, folks. Um, but the big thing is, is you don't kick a person while they're down. So we've got to try to work, help the ones up that are willing to get up on their own also. It's America. You know, we've all had a rough spot. But like I say, you don't kick a person while they're down, and we've got to work on it. How we do that, I honestly don't know. We're going to have to get more into it and invest a lot of time talking to our churches, talking to people like Jim Leonard who are dealing with it on the front lines. But I believe our churches could be a big, big point of help in this aspect like they used to be. Thank you. Many. Um, like I said earlier, uh, we went down to the river bottom yesterday, walked through the camps, talked to the folks. Uh, there was a couple that love the lifestyle. That's where they want to be. Uh, Free-spirited, they don't want any help from us. But there was lots down there that wanted our help. And the main issue was jobs and affordable housing. So I think working together as a region, we can develop a plan. And Yuba City, like I said, doesn't have enough affordable housing. So that would be the first thing that we really need to address. Uh, I was at the consortium a couple of days ago, and we have a plan. They're getting ready to do another for affordable housing uh, complex over in the Richland Housing Center. So a little bit goes uh, a long ways, and the ones that want it, I'm sure we'll be able to help them. Thank you. Fujin. First of all, let's differentiate homelessness and transients, because the homelessness is a bigger uh, issue. We have transients in our area that are 
not folks that are wanting to be helped. We have homeless families that need to be helped. We have a lot of children that are out there that are homeless, that are couch surfing, and are in a situation that need to be helped. So from that standpoint, um, we have a huge program of the consortium and things that are going on within the county, Yuba Center, on both sides of the river, Yuba City and Marysville. Working with that, if I'm elected to the council, I'll continue to work on that situation. But part of this is going to take a lot of money to create these things. Our um, churches in our area have been incredibly giving and have been doing an incredible job to take care of a lot of the homeless in our area. Those folks continue to come here because they know that we are a giving community. So there's a hard issue on how we're going to handle that. And I just say it's not something that one person can do. It is a group effort. Okay, thank you. We have a lot has been said about the city's ag trip to China and also sister city trips. How do you feel about trade development trips in general? They're good. No, I think it's a positive thing. I think we've got, uh, maintain the relationship with our, our sister city in China to, to develop those relationships and trade us uh, both, both ways uh, that uh, we need to do differently. I think we need to incorporate that and, and it, goes, it goes the other way. Rita? I agree with Wade. Um, if it's anything to improve our, our economy here and our local government here in New York City, Sutter County, um, any kind of training and you know communication and anything that's going to help us um, run for it. Okay, Jason, who's paying for it? <laughs> if the city council is paying for it on their own, great. If the city staff paying for it on their own, great. It's not our right as a taxpayer to be sending these people on trips. I'm sorry. You know, you can do a lot on the internet surfing and figuring out what's working for people and what's not. You can do Skype and teleconference with these folks. But I'm sorry, when we just start sending people on trips and it's not their money that's sending them on a trip, I'm not for that at all. Sorry. Right uh, city of City has been sister city for over 30 years. We have a great relationship with our sister city in Japan. They come visit us, we go visit them. It's been going on for 30 years. They help the economy in both uh, both areas, Japan and the U.S. City. Uh, I'm all for it. Uh, it's a great place. It's uh, great exposure, and it's helping us, and it's also helping them. Thank you. Well, I kind of agree with Jason in the aspect of who's paying for it. it it's important, like Manny said, for 30 years we've had a sister city in Japan. Um, just recently in the Appeal Democrat, there was a discussion of a group that came over from, uh, I believe it was Japan that came over and was uh, having, it was China, excuse me, China, that was having a conversation about our agricultural aspects here in our community. So if ag is our biggest asset, which it is, and it is a county issue more than it is a city of Yuba City issue, I don't necessarily think that the whole entire city council needs to go on these trips, but I do believe that that building of that relationship and to continue to foster it is important. The question is, who really needs to go and why are they going? John? The, the question was, how do I feel about trade development trips? And I think there are some value in those. I think that they're, if they're managed right, they're paid for properly, and we have some follow through. Who is going? Why are they going? What are the results? What are the action items? Make sure they follow up, make sure they're done. Make sure the city and the citizens get the bang for the buck. If that fails, cancel it or re retool and try it again. It doesn't matter if it's Japan or Marysville. If we're going to spend money that we, that we pay for in taxes, let's make sure we always get the bang for the buck. Okay. We have time for one more question. Steve, you'll be asking uh, Dina. Yeah. Um. Do you favor the annexation of the so-called keyhole area? Um, many of the residents of that area are, are worried about the, the $59 million pension debt. Uh, you might want to address that as well. You mean the unfunded pension? Um, wow, well, uh, we've got a lot of work to do in our city, I think. 
Um, I, I believe, you know, the city, the people um, that live in that area um, have a right to, you know, they have a right to vote. I think if they, if they vote against it or um, then we have to follow, you know, what the people want. Um, if the people aren't against it, I think um, hopefully the city will explain the process to these people. Um, and, you know, we do want further development in, in our city. Uh, we want to create jobs, with, which it will create jobs. Um, but I just think we need to let the people know, um, you know, what it's going to cost or uh, just let them know and not just throw bills and fees and taxes at them, you know. I think if you explain the process uh, I, I, and communicate is a big deal. Thank you. Jason? Well, yeah, this is a sticky wicket. I mean, Matt hit it right on the head whenever he answered it. He did an excellent job, I thought. The fact is, is you have a lot of people there who don't have a voice because they can't vote and can't push the city council to not do it. Which, if you live in that area, you should be able to vote, yes or no, for it rather than just petition not to have it done. That being said, it is progress. It is right in the middle of the city. Why it wasn't annexed a long time ago, nobody seems to can, nobody can seem to answer that question. But that being said, am I for it or do I oppose it? I would really want to get boots on the ground, talk to the people, and find out, and bring it to some kind of vote, rather than just annex it and say, you know what, we're gonna take it, done. But also, for the folks that live in that area, realistically, you're right in the middle, you're within the sphere of influence, you're in the city right there, I mean, you're in the middle of it. More than likely, it's going to happen. But the fact is, is I really believe you should have a voice. And that's where we run into the issue. So I think you need to hit up your county supervisors and push them to figure it out. Because the fact is, is right now, if the city annexes it, you don't have a voice. And you need to be heard. Maybe. Okay, that has been a, like Jason said, it's been a very hot topic. Uh, I've been to several council meetings, I've been to several workshops. I've listened to the people in the key pocket, and I've listened to city staff. Uh, on the funded, unfunded liability that we have, uh, on the pension plan, when you go to the grocery store and buy groceries, and you go to the store and buy clothes, the sales tax that you spend is help paying down the pension plan of the city and also that has helped to pay the pension plan down also for the county. Every, every little bit goes to help pay this down. It's a predicament that statewide has gotten into. It's not just us, it's the whole entire state. It's like a house payment. It doesn't need to be paid off today. It can be paid off 20, 25 years from now. Um, the annexation, uh, it's up to the people to keep pocket. And only the people that keep pocket are going to vote on this. It's uh, if they, uh, and whatever they do, I will totally support whatever they say, yes or no. Thank you. Well, there's people for it and there's people against it. I'm not in that situation, and I don't think that actually us as council will even be a part of that decision because it's already in the process right now. Uh, 45 days into it, and so <clears throat> I would like to say that the annexation would be a good thing all the way around to include our city and to expand it for its purposes of a tax base and development purposes in the future. The folks that are in that area have long held their properties and do not want to be annexed. There's a huge voice of those, but there's also a voice that want to go forward. So it's a dilemma that we face, but I think ultimately it's going to wind up happening whether the folks want it or not just because there's not enough of them that are clearly educated on the issue and they're not stepping up and voicing their concerns at the council. At the last council meeting, there was hardly anybody there to actually say anything against it. Sean. Yes, very tough, uh, tough topic. I do think that my opinion shouldn't matter. My, I think it's the opinion of the people who live there, who go to work every day, who, who see them how those neighborhoods are and have been there for years and years. And I think it should be up to them. Now, if I take up and just as me as a person, you take a look at the map, it does make sense. These services that will be learned, the fire department, the police department, all these things will come into play. They're not obligated to join city uh, water, sewer, or anything like that. They can keep it just how they want. 
it does make sense because the city is growing. As far as the unfunded liability for pensions, like has already been said, when you pay the sales tax, you're indirectly paying for the, this unfunded liability goes towards that. Also, we're already paying for the fire department as well. So it's already going to that anyway. And it just puts the people at ease. There have been cities that have gone completely bankrupt, Vallejo and Stockton. The citizens were not uh, invoiced for their share of the liability for pensions. It just doesn't work that way. It's not gonna, you're not going to get a bill once that happens. So I think you have to listen to the folks right now that are passing the um, the uh, they're, they're voting for the uh, the annexation. The folks that are against it, uh, I think I think they're against it for all the wrong reasons. I think it does make sense for the city because it's it, 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 the city would run more efficiently. Uh, a problem I have with the annexation is in, in the general plan for the annexation, it calls for the hiring of five additional police officers, and I'm not sure how we can do that if we're currently running at a deficit of eight police officers. So the folks that have that concern have a valid concern. As, as far as the pension liability, this is not something that's going to be due tomorrow. Uh, it is a valid concern, uh, it, but it's not unique to this area. Most counties and cities in this state have the same issue. So I think what you need to do is you need to uh, educate those folks in the keyhole. Um, but once again, if, if, if the ballot, uh, if they do get, get enough signatures for a, a, a no on it, I think you have to respect that. Okay. Thank you very much. And I appreciate all the comments. We're going to go to our closing statement. Each candidate gets up to uh, 90 seconds, a minute and a half. And we'll start with Jason. Well, first off, I'd like to thank the Chamber tonight for having us all out here. And also you folks for coming out. I mean, this is huge. This is great to see this many people active in our community. And also my beautiful wife. She's put up with this campaign ups and downs and backs and forths and everything else. And it's a, it's, it's a roller coaster ride. Anybody who's ran knows. So, it, But it is a lot of fun at the same time. So in closing, what I want to say is Basically, everybody in this audience, we're not always going to see eye to eye. But I promise you will know where I stand. I'm not a politician. I'm not wishy-washy. I don't change. And I'm not going to change. So it's easy to hit that target. Whenever you get a real politician or moving around, it's got to hit that hard to hit that target. The one thing I will promise you is you will have a voice at the city council. We will hear you and we will push forward with what the will of the people is. And we will start holding our executive staff accountable for what they're doing. It's not going to be a rubber stamp every time it comes across. Whenever they put out a budget, and they miss that budget by $900,000, and it turns into $2 million on a $2 million project, we're going to ask why. And we're going to make sure the city administrator knows that he needs to put that engineer that made that mistake on notice not that it's their job, but my gosh, they need to start doing their job just a little bit better. Because in my business, that would be the end of that job. Thanks. Manny. What makes me the best candidate for the next city councilman? I've lived here my entire life. I've raised my children here. I've contributed to the community. I'm a 36-year member of the U City News Lodge. I'm a member of the Early Risers Kiwanis and on the board. I'm also a member of the Teachable Alliance Club. I'm a second year vice president. I enjoy the community. This is a great place to live. It's a great place to raise my family. I've uh, served as a citizen of the community for 35 years, nearly 35 years, working with the City of New City. I have a great working relationship with city staff and city council. I also have a great relationship with the citizens of the community. Uh, we, can all, we all work together as one. And I think that as we all work together as one, we can make our community even better and greater than it is today. Uh, I've been endorsed by the U City Firefighters, the U City Employees Local One, the local skilled unions, and I've also been endorsed by several former council members. I'm number six on the ballot, but I'm number one in the hearts of you folks in New City. Thank you. <laughs> Well, first of all, I 
hope that I earned the respect for tonight and that you would possibly consider me as your next council person. Um, as a business owner in this community, I think um, my first and foremost thing is I want to let you know, I have a great working relationship with a lot of folks in this community. The city staff, the city administration, the business people down on Plymouth Street, our fire department, our police department. As the event chairperson for the strolls for the last five years, I've managed and logistically taken care of those events that have 15,000 people that come down twice a year to Yuba City. So that's a, it's a little bit of a task to take care of and keep everybody safe. So project management is really important. Follow through in the details. That's all part of what I do. Um, I would very much appreciate the opportunity to serve you. My, I have an office now. The restaurant is now closed. I have an office down on Plymouth Street. I am available. My office phone number is back on my flyers. My cell phone number is probably just about in most people's pocket. Um, so I am available and I want to listen and I want to find out what you would like me to represent. It's not so much about what I feel is important. It's really about what the citizens here in this, in this room and in this community want. And I'd like to help provide that. I'd like to be a part of the group that plans our future and goes forward. Thank you. And Sean, 90 seconds. It would be an honor to serve you as a member of your city council as a, uh, for my hometown. It's so strange when I uh, go over here, for example, Butte House and Stabler, and I see my fat head on the poster. Uh, the, same, the, the same story. I used to ride my 10 speed to every day or every week, but my mom didn't know. And, uh, you know, it, it's so great to see, to have a historical perspective on our city. And having dedicated my life to, to public service and public safety, I've been, and worked my way up through the ranks, traveled around, I, I've learned what works, what doesn't work, the value of establishing positive relationships, using those to leverage things for a common good, getting the input from everybody who's involved. It's not a one-man show, for sure. We are here as a, as a, uh, trying to get on city council to work together as a team for all of you, and that's an honor. I want to do that. I've used my education. I've worked my way up. I have a shoot, master's degree in criminal justice administration and security, bachelor's degree, and then my associates I received in college. I can leverage that along with my experience managing my share of $2 billion budget for the state for you. And personnel management, like I said, our, our facilities, fleet, all the things we talk about, the budget jargon, managing public resources, have built in relationships with both city councils, both boards of supervisors, Assemblyman Nielsen and Gallagher. And Assemblyman Nielsen has endorsed me along with the Firefighters oh. Association as well. Along with many other people I can't list because my time is up. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Wait. I would like to thank the, uh, the Chamber and the Appeal Democrat for, for putting this on today. Uh, this is a great honor. Um, when, when folks ask me why I want to run for, for city council, why would, you know, why, would you, why would you want to fundraise thousands and thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of dollars just to wallpaper the town in your face? The way I respond to that is civic duty. I, mean, I, I believe running for office is, is civic duty in the, in the purest form of the word. Um, I've, I've dealt with many of the businesses in this area uh, in my time in, in, uh, in the private sector, and I've worked with most of or some of your children uh, while working with the school districts, so I've seen the future and I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. I am number one on the ballot and I would appreciate your vote in, in, in November. <laughs> Thank you very much. I would also um, like to tell y'all I'm number two on the ballot. Um, but I want to thank the Chamber and the Pill Democrat for your time and um, giving us, all of us, the opportunity to speak, uh, you know, on the behalf of the people um, that we're going to be representing. Um, I think the goal is to um, support the, the community, um, work with uh, constituents uh, that, you know, once I'm on the ballot or once I'm in that seat. Um, my goal is to work with all the people of the city, county, city, agencies. I'm going to get myself involved and make a difference in our community and I'm going to be there for the people and on their concerns um, or issues and just 
communicate. Um, you know, and I've been hearing all night about everybody saying, um, you know, we're going to educate the people. Well, those people are smart. I mean, you know, we're somebody saying that they're not smart. We need to educate. And I just think we need to communicate together, work as a team. Um, we, you know, we we've, we've got to fix a lot of things, and it's going to take everyone to do it. And I am nervous. Sorry, um, but I want to I want to be here for the community and um, make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to all of the uh, council candidates.